Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, are about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence, which is what this show is all about. My special guest today was the head coach of the Stanford men's tennis team for 38 years, winning 17 national championships. And I refer to him as the John Wooden of college tennis. He is the legendary coach Dick Gould. And today we are going beyond national championships. Hey, Coach Gould, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Rusty, what a pleasure to be with you, my gosh. And uh, I didn't win any of those championships. Those are my guys. So you have good players, you're all of a sudden a great coach. And I'm not very smart, but I'm smart enough not never to have uh, never to have scheduled Puno. <laughs> well, you know, coach, you, you know, you're someone that I've greatly admired uh, from afar for decades. And, and I'm so happy to call you my new friend now. Well, it's been really, I've, I've heard a lot about you. I had the good fortune of having one or two of your players on my teams at Stanford, wonderful young men, and they always spoke very, very highly of you. And uh, so it's a pleasure to meet finally. And, and I must tell you, I, I really, really enjoyed reading your two books, Beyond the Line and, and Beyond, uh, and beyond my right here, I got Beyond the Lines, Beyond the Grame. They're, they're both tremendous, tremendous publications. And it's very inspiring to me, Rusty. Well, we'll talk about those a, a little bit later in the show, but I want to first ask you, Coach, about, you know, why did you first become a coach? <laughs> well, before that, why did I, how did I start tennis? Uh, I, I'm a farm boy from Southern California, and uh, neither of my folks played tennis, but they were both athletic and played at, at, at athletic, athletics in college. Uh, one day, my mom said, I was about 11 years old, you're going to have a tennis lesson. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to go downtown with white shorts and, uh, and walk around with all my buddies who wear Levi's and boots. No way. And she said, well, do you want to ride your horse this summer? And I said, uh, I'll take the lesson. <laughs> I'll, try, <laughs> I'll try one. But the guy that taught me was a guy named Harold Chafee, whose daughter, Nancy Chafee Kiner, Ralph Kiner's wife, uh, was a, a great player, top five in the world. And, and he was a very dynamic guy. He knew I didn't want to be there. But he made everything I did, Rusty, everything I did was exciting. That first ball I hit, I thought I'd gone to the moon. I was so excited. And everything he did, he equated to another sport. And so you stepped into the punch like you stepped in the hit like Rocky Marciano steps in the punch. You stepped, uh, you watched the ball like Ralph Kiner watched it come out of the pitcher's hand. And, and so all of a sudden, it wasn't a sissy sport. I really, and I couldn't wait to get back and start hitting that ball against the garage. On a gravel, on a gravel driveway, by the way, <laughs> it was bouncing all over. But then I went into it. My mom was a teacher, and at Stanford, I majored in physical education. Uh, decided I was going into uh, coaching about my junior year, and I changed my major from history to, to from political science to uh, physical education. And lucky enough to land a high school job in the area after graduating, getting my master's degree and teaching credential, and then uh, spent. Uh, a local junior college opened up, Foothill Junior College, and I spent four years there as coach. And then after those six years, uh, I was a pro at a club along the way uh, during the weekends and in the summertime. And then the Stanford job, my coach retired, opened up, and I probably would not have left the junior college, Foothill, to go anywhere other than to Stanford. Uh, junior college coach in those days was really a, a great job, and I loved it. I had great kids. One Hawaiian uh, fellow, Rodney Cott. Really, really, uh, really a great player. He was the number one or two in the country, actually, in the 1500s, and won the state championship at Foothill for me in singles. And uh, I, I, lo I love coaching. I love teaching. And, and the rest, I, I just stuck with it all my life. Well, Coach, you know, your wife, Ann, is a longtime coach as well. Uh, you know, and you guys make such a great team. How's, how's Ann doing? Thank you for asking. She's babysitting right now, a couple of grandkids, <laughs> <laughs> but she's doing great. She she coached uh, right when we started at Title Nine. I had the pleasure of I I knew her as a student at Stanford. She was a little bit younger younger than I, excuse me, but uh, she grew up. She's American, but her father moved to Venezuela with a steel company, 
uh, when she was uh, five years old. And much of that time was spent later on in Venezuela. And she actually represented Venezuela in junior Wimbledon. And a great group of players from this big club down there. It used to be on an old Caribbean circuit, they called it, at, uh, in Caracas, the Altamira Club. And then she came straight to Stanford when she was 16, and she played in the team there. And that's how I got to know her. And I hired her to help in summer camps and some of my teaching programs. And she did a great job. And all of a sudden, Title IX comes about, 1975 or thereabouts. And so she ended up... Uh, uh, I ended up talking her into taking the job at Stanford, and uh, she was working as a local pro and helping me at the time teaching some of my teaching programs. And she did great there. Four years, she never finished out of the top two in the country. She won the national championship in her third year, and yet she didn't really, really enjoy it, Rusty. I think, you know, she likes, she's so well organized. She likes things. She likes to print it out and have it exactly the way you want it. But as a coach, you know, it doesn't happen that way. You, have it all worked out, who's going to practice with whom, uh, what time you're going to start, stop, get done, everything. And one of the gals say, oh, gosh, I'm going to be a little late today. Another one say, I don't feel well today. Another would say, oh, my boyfriend broke up. I can't play today. And so it was like this for her. And yet for me and for you, you were in it long enough, you know, the thrill of it really is dealing with these kinds of things that come out of coaching. And, and that's life, frankly. And, and, uh, but that was a little bit too much for her. So she retired from coaching and stayed at Stanford another 26 years, a total of 30 as uh, the head instructor of all the PE classes. And she loved that. That was no, oh, that's no, the... much more. The kids were there a certain time. Everyone was happy. They got out of class. They were glad to be out of there and uh, on the courts. And that was really fun for her. No, oh, that's so interesting to hear, you know, and, and I want to, I want to talk to you about uh, one of your former players, John McEnroe. Who, what, how, do you, what... how do you spell that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what, what was your experiences like uh, with him on your team? Well, I, I, I love John. I didn't, uh, he went to a school, Trinity School in Texas, uh, excuse me, in New York, a really good private school, and was a good student. He played soccer there and, and was a good junior player. He wasn't the best player in the country, however. I think uh, Brian Godfrey might have been a little bit ahead of him in the rankings, uh, but really a good player. And, and, uh, or, Larry Gottfried, excuse me. And uh, he started playing some tournaments in the spring in the evening in a little circuit that a guy named Bill Reardon ran in the East. And he did really well playing pass rail, Ash, uh, Stan Smith. He held his own with those guys. And so he was able, and, and he was on the United States national team, junior team. So he was able to qualify for a trip to Wimbledon. And he's, the junior event starts the second week of the tournament. But his spring with the other adult tournaments in, in New York was so, was so good that he got a wild card into the qualifying for the main draw. And that's the week before the main, first week of Wimbledon. So he went through qualifying, he qualified for the main draw, and then he kept on winning. So the second week, uh, actually the third week he was there, when, the, main, when uh, the junior event started, he couldn't play because he's still in the main event. And he got to the semifinals and he had decided in, I think it was April 1st, May 1st, he had to let Stanford know he was coming. And he said he was going to come to Stanford. And then the summer and it goes on and he did really well Wimbledon and getting to the semifinals and then did well the rest of the summer, played every week. And so I thought I'd never see him again. I remember he called me from the airport and in those days it was legal to pick them up and bring them to campus. He said, coach, I'm at the airport. Where are you? I said, Mac, uh, I thought you turned pro. I gave your scholarship away. <laughs> <laughs> a little silence, and then we both had a big laugh out of it and then uh, brought him down to campus. We had uh, really a wonderful time. I, I, the first guy, Rusty, you know, everyone you treat a little differently. And in college, at least it's a year-round sport you play all year. And, and so uh, he had played so much in the spring and then all summer without missing a tournament that I gave him the fall off. And I've never done that before. And I, but I wanted him fresh at the end of the year. And it's probably the best thing I did. He looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> but I also knew in fairness that Johnny Mack wasn't a great practice player in the sense of the word that you and I as a coach probably think of. You know, go out and you groove your strokes and you practice a certain thing over and over and over again, maybe use a ball machine or that would drive Mack totally crazy. And so I got out of that and then by not having him there. And then uh, he came out in the uh, winter and, and we had matches right away. So he, and he was a great team player, probably the greatest team player I've ever had, or one of the greatest. He really cared about his teammates and 
was an incredible person uh, to have as a player and, and team pl and a team player. No, I, I love hearing those insights from you. And I, I did hear that, you know, he was an awesome team player. And coach, I want to ask you about, you know, my books about what were some things that stood out to you in it? Well, I, Rusty, I, you know, I've read a million leadership books and, and I get sent them a lot as well. And, and I've done forwards and, and a lot of, a lot of things for people who've written them. And, uh, but I think in looking at your book, I, it just hit me, both of them hit me so well and, and really resonated with me. They were simple, they were concise, extremely well organized. Yes, you equated it with tennis and, and that's fine, but it was nice you equated it to something in everyday life that's going on. And I think when you're coaching a sport, of course, you, you are frankly, you are a leader of a team. And everyone's, if you're in a family, you're a leader of your family team. Uh, in some sense, in the word, you're a leader. If you're in the business team, of course, same thing. But the, the analogy between that kind of leadership and sport leadership is exactly the same. Uh, you have to set, you have to have a philosophy you have to have a set of uh, ideals you're striving to reach, a vision for what you want to accomplish, and you have to be able to tell your, your team that those things are important and are relevant. And you just nailed the book. I, I thought, I thought uh, they both were exceptional, and uh, I'm so glad to have my copy right here. It's right. I put it on my pillow at night, and it's just, just, uh, it's just, it's just been, it was an incredible read for me, and I, I was so excited to to read them. I read them both in a day each. Really, I couldn't put them down. Well, I feel so honored, Coach, that that you that you like the books. And, you know, I for me, um, you know, five different people have come up to me sharing that they were contemplating suicide. And then after reading the books, they it really changed their mindset and, and you know, their outlook in life and really gave them inspiration and hope. And for me, I never thought writing the books would actually impact people to the point of saving their lives. Well, I thought, Rusty, you know, you look at, you look at the leadership books that you've read and I've read, and, and here's the, how you're a great leader. You do this one, this two, three, this four, this boom, 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 boom. And, and there's no, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't bring it to life. You read Jack Welch's book and how he led General Electric. Well, you know, that's a great book, but it, it doesn't resonate because it's out there a little bit. Uh, ironically, I'm writing one too now. It's called, uh, I don't know what the publisher is going to call it, but right now it's called The Anatomy of a Champion in Sport, Business, and Life, very, very much like yours. And fortunately, it's pretty much done, or I'd be pleasurizing like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but it's really, it, it's, it's it. people would ask me, Rusty, you know, did, did your teams have a culture? Or a guy asked me one time, he's an All American baseball player at UCLA, and he was a Hall of Fame down there. And, started several companies in, in uh, Silicon Valley and was a great supporter and friend of mine. And one day he asked me, we probably won 10 or 12 national championships. Coach, how do you do this? I said, Jack, we have the best players. And he said, looked at me, he said, uh -uh, I know better than that. Teams with the best players don't always win and certainly don't win as much as you have. Uh, your teams have. And uh, it got me thinking, you know, I didn't, it, it really bothered me because I couldn't quantify why we were successful in my mind. Uh, and so this is kind of interesting, it's a little bit different approach than yours. And I have 200 guys who are still alive who play for me. And I've stayed in touch with them very well over the years. And I sent them a list of 20 questions. And there were things like, did we have a culture? How do we deal with ego? Um, did, you feel, did you feel relevant? Well, if you're not starting, were you relevant? Do you feel a part of the team? Uh, what, what, what happened? Because I honestly could not answer these questions. And I had 165 guys respond. And these, it took a good two hours to fill out this question here of 20 questions. And then when I got the responses, I set them up into different topic areas and, uh, and chapters. And then I started writing and using their quotes to introduce a topic or a chapter or to bring out something I wanted to emphasize. And I learned a lot about myself and about my coaching, good or bad. Uh, the biggest, I put in there in capital letters when I sent them request, be candid, don't hold anything back. And it's a fast day. I think it's gonna really be fascinating. I hope it's half as good as yours, half as received half as well as yours, but it's a little different approach. It's not, 
me as the guy telling you how to do it. It's more, and that's what I liked about your book. It was, uh, it was based on how your kids reacted, what you did get your kids going. But I didn't know what worked for these guys. You know, Tim, when I started coaching the Vietnam War was going on. Well, I had to be a different kind of coach then when these kids were worried about Vietnam or Rod, the Rodney King uh, problems down, the racial problems down and the watch riots. And, 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 and so that was a different time. And it's, it covers 40 years. That's a long time. A lot of things happened in this world. And, and how did I handle those things and how did I adapt? And um, I never had team rules as an example. I, I soon they put a rule out there, it was broken. Then what do I do? I'm stuck with it. Uh, and and it, it was really interesting to read these guys' answers. So I'm, I'm anxious to get this out there. I have a reader, a writer, a good friend of mine who's helping me put it in the right framework and stuff. And we're changing the chapters around a little bit. But I'm excited about it. And I, I think I was really, of all the books I've read, I think I think that yours is the best I've ever read. Oh, geez. What a, that's a huge compliment coming from you. And coach, I'm super excited and looking forward to reading your book when it comes out. And I want to ask you about uh, Mike Bryan and Bob Bryan, known as the Bryan brothers for people who, who don't know. Number one in the world now, I mean, retired, but they're the greatest doubles team of all time. How was it uh, having the Bryan brothers on your team? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. I, I never recruited, I never went to visit John McEnroe at home, at his home. And uh, he came out on a, on a visit, but it was short and quick. Uh, the Bryans I visited at home, in fact, uh, their subdivision was on some property that my dad, near a property my dad once had on his farm. And I used to ride my horseback, my horse right through where their house was. But I went in the house, first of all, and their parents are very, very good players. Wayne was a great player and played number one my first couple of years of coaching when he was at Cal Santa Barbara. And they got us once and we got him once. And Kathy was a top world top 20 player, played at USC. Uh, really great parents and very knowledgeable in tennis and were the boys' coaches all the way through. And as I go into the house, uh, I noticed there was no TV. They didn't have a TV in the house. And they had, there was a, piano, a keyboard, there was a guitar, and they raised their kids in music and in tennis. It was amazing. And really two rare kids. They were pretty much set to go to USC somewhere or other that uh, they ended up at Stanford. And, and um, two of the greatest guys ever, if you took how you would like to have your son or daughter grow up. You'd want them to the values that these two boys were taught by their parents. I give the parents so much credit for what they did. And they just, uh, they're, they're incredible people. We, they, they've been to Hawaii with us a couple of times, the team, John McEnroe was there in 1978. That time we're, both times, that time we're in Kauai with John uh, and uh, for the week. And it was really, so they all have a little Hawaiian blood and introduced, them, introduced to them by Stanford Tennis. No, I like hearing that coach. And, you know, I, I want to ask you about what were your priorities and you know how you're uh, in terms of, you know, building a culture of excellence for your teams. What, what were your top priorities in doing that? Well, you know, young coach starting out, I, I, I really felt something was lacking in Stanford tennis as a player when I was there. And this is not a reflection on my coach who was an extremely good coach did things differently in those days than we do nowadays. And, and I'm sure then they will do tomorrow, but, but a different kind of coach. Uh, he was a part-time coach. He'd get there at three o'clock with a box of four cans in it. And first guys there got the balls, the new balls. The rest of us had a box of old balls, uh, no baskets, no hoppers in the example in those days. Uh, and he would leave at five o'clock. So he was a, a club manager and a club pro in the area uh, as most coaches were in those days in college. Um, uh, we didn't really, we come out and we'd be there from three to five and it wasn't organized. We just grabbed the first guy out. We'd go hit with him. Maybe play a set, play a couple of games or hit or whatever, but there was no real direction. Uh, I think, so I came in thinking that Stanford had, we could do something about that. There was something more that was missing that we could do. And I felt that with the weather we have in Northern California, not quite as good as Southern California, but close. In those days, there, were, there weren't a lot of indoor courts, so the best teams were in Texas or in Southern California, Miami, maybe Florida. Uh, but I thought we could do something at Stanford. But the attitude of Stanford athletics in that time was really, really negative one. Um, we can't get a smart kid into, into, into school. 
uh, they don't have time just to be good in academics and in athletics. In fact, football team in 1960, my last year when I was getting my master's was zero and 10. And we had really had not had any success in sports for a period of time. Even the coaches were making excuses for this. So we had a culture in our athletic department that did not lend itself to winning. And then John Ralston came in as football coach, a very, very positive guy later to be in the Denver Broncos. And I think my third or fourth year, he took us to two Rose Bowls. And we were starting to build a tennis pro number two. But you know, when you talk about goals and vision, which are the basis of culture uh, or lead to culture, I came in and said, okay, guys, we're gonna, we're, our goal is to win the national championship. And the guys, the guys are sitting there and they're getting sun, their shirts are off, getting a good tan, and they're looking at me. And in the book, it comes out, one of the guys, says, we looked at each other, we rolled our eyes, and who is this guy? He's crazy. That's never gonna happen here at Stanford. And I learned, I learned that as a leader, you better have a goal that the people on your team or the people you're leading, whatever kind of team it is, can relate to. And they couldn't do that. And it was really frustrating for me because I expected more out of them. Uh, and in my, in my, another thing I learned at that time, Rusty, in my haste to develop a championship team, everything was important. Guys, if we win this match, then we can do this. We have to win this match, guys, or, you know, and it just put too much pressure on them. And finally, some way or other, we won our first national championship in 73, seven years later. Good coach probably would have done it two years later, but it took me seven years. And, uh, and I thought I'd gone and uh, died and gone to heaven, and I didn't care if we ever won another one. I'd gotten my ego out of the way. We, I proved to myself it could be done. And the funny thing was, in spite of a lot of things happening internally with the team, we won it again the next year. And then we won it again and again. And I never had a goal of winning the championship after that. It was just something that just was, I'm sure like your same own teams. Once you get that started, if you don't have to keep preaching about it. It just kind of keeps happening. They don't want to be the team that lets you down and lets the record go away. And so that's a powerful thing as a coach to have, not having to talk about it, just having it be a goal. And in the book, the guys say, coach, you never set a goal. You never didn't. Sometimes I got mad because you never even seemed to care if we won or lost. But the point is, you want to get a little better each day, Rusty. And your book points that out well. You want to be a little better person. You want to come off that court or wherever you are, come out of the office, wherever you are, feeling that you help somebody, feeling that everyone is a little different, a little better today or tomorrow, that you yourself are better today than you were yesterday. And that's a beautiful part of coaching because you can always improve. And if you don't, you get passed by in a hurry. <laughs> That's so true. And coach, what what did you do to take the pressure off of your guys to win? Like, you know, you said in the beginning, you were like, just a, you know, we got to win. We got to win this match so this can happen. What did you end up doing to take pressure off? Well, we did a lot of fun things. As an example, our trips, we went every year, we took a trip somewhere uh, and and we we come to Kauai and come to Hawaii. We always play a match with Johnny Nelson's team at the University of Hawaii. What a great guy, by the way. Uh, uh, we always play John at the University of Hawaii, uh, somewhere, somewhere in Hawaii. And uh, it was fun for the guys. And, and it just, we did a lot of, we had the Playboy Mansion, Hugh Hefner's place in LA. Uh, we would play, have a team golf tournament every year. And then the guys could play golf. That was always a blast. Uh, in the hills behind Stanford, the beautiful, beautiful trails and, and, and redwood trees and streams and always take him on a nature hike, which became very famous. The guys, oh, come on, coach. Not again, yep. Come on, guys, we're going tomorrow, two o'clock, don't be late. <laughs> and, uh, and then the other part that brought us together a lot, we didn't have a lot of money in our program that day. We had, to, we had to raise money to make our program go. So we did a lot of fundraising events. And it's amazing to me how much the guys bought into that and really uh, it, it got them out in front of the community. It helped us with our attendance and matches. Uh, we, hit, we had to write the tennis room. We started it good. And we, we played indoors several times. We were over 7,000 people in an indoor pavilion. And it was really, really a, a big thing. No, it, it's so important to really, you know, take your team and do activities off the court, which really leads to, you know, team bonding, like, like you said. And, and uh, coach, I want to ask you about greatness. How do you define greatness? 
Well, that's a great question, Rusty. I, I really haven't thought too much about that. I think uh, I think more on a, a smaller scale. I think we would try to be a little better today than we were yesterday in everything we do, our relationships with other people, uh, our relationships with friends, non-friends, uh, our relationships professionally with how we're improving ourselves. Uh, I, think, uh, I think success is more defined by improvement, as an example. And I think success can lead to greatness. Uh, but success doesn't mean winning, and we got to be really careful we don't get the two mixed up. I think it's hard, and it's easy in swimming. You know, you 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 finish last in the race, but you better your own time. You can see your improvement. In tennis, I remember one day at practice, Johnny Max four courts away, and I'm pretty vocal in practice, and I hollered down, "Hey, Mac, that's what I wanted at forehand." And he dropped his racket, turned around, faced me, put his hands on his hips, coach. You cannot be serious. That ball went in the bottom of the net and it was match point. I said, John, but you got turned better. You loaded better net forehand. That's exactly what I want. And he just shook his head. He couldn't understand that. You know, it's a kind of thing. You look at the parts that make the whole better. And those little parts help give you more success, which doesn't mean winning, but more improvement, which can lead to things happening, which can lead to greatness. But I think greatness is more than winning. It's more how you carry yourself. And to me, someone who's really made a great mark in this world is someone who's an example to other people on how they should be living their lives, the values that they incorporate into their lives. And especially that involves in helping others. And I think we really help teach our kids on our team that they have a responsibility to help other people throughout their lives. Well said, Coach. I, I like hearing that, uh, that definition there. I, I, I totally agree with you. And I want to ask you, what's the best advice you ever received? <laughs> pretty good, Rusty, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, I'm coaching football at the time and in high school, and I'm coaching the lowest level in team, the junior varsity, junior varsity. They're ninth and 10th graders. They're a little slow maturing physically. And, and you know, I don't think many of us automatically enjoy contact, but you, you can learn to appreciate it. And uh, I played a little football in high school, not very in junior high school, not football, high school a little bit, but mostly basketball. And, and so I didn't know too much about it, but that's what I was assigned to do in addition to coaching tennis and teaching in the classroom. And we had a little one-on-one -on -one tackling drill. And uh, Eddie Matias, I'll never forget. We run seven, seven, say seven yards down the line at each other, the tackler, the whole team standing around and the guy tackling, the tack, guy being tackled and tackling him. And they run at each other and Eddie would get just before contact, he slipped and he fell to his left. Hey, come on, let's do it again. Puts the blows, there he goes, slips and falls to the right. Come on, hey, yeah. And he gets up this time, third time, slips, falls back on his back. And he's lying there on his back, looking up at the sky. The whole team's around him now, 25 guys, whatever we had. And I go up to him, I'm trying to be Vince Lombardi. And I go up to him and without knowing who Vince Lombardi is. You saw, and every swear word, every vile word I could say, Rusty, I'm yelling, I'm screaming, and I ran out of words, and I had nothing more to say. And he just keeps looking at me. And he waves, me, waves at me, the one-fingered wave. <laughs> and he says, F-K, you, Mr. Gould. And I go, ah. <laughs> and then I just started <laughs> cracking up. And the team then took the pressure off. They started cracking up. And I'm right there, then and there, Rusty, never try to be someone you are not. Be yourself but hopefully make yourself a little better so that person that is yourself is one who can lead positive, by positive example to other people. Oh, that's such a great story, Coach. And Coach, I want to thank you for taking time in your schedule to be on the show today and, and really sharing your wisdom. I mean, it's such a thrill for me to have you on the show today. Well, my pleasure entirely, Rusty, and keep up the great work. I, I, I'm so, so thankful for what you've written. It just, uh, it's inspiring. Uh, it's going to affect a lot of people, like you say, and it has already, and, and a lot more to come. Uh, keep up the great work, and it's what a pleasure to be here with you. I'm coming over there now in about a month. Be ready for me. Oh, I, I'm ready. You be, I'm totally ready for you to My come. My place in Kauai, <laughs> I'm going there, but, <laughs> but uh, the, April 5th, I think the island opens up. That's the day I'm arriving. It better open up. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely collect, uh, connect in person, Coach. I look forward to it, Russ. Thank you so very much. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii.
For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com, and my books are available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. I hope that Coach Gould and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.